Famously, of the seven wonders of the ancient world, only one remains standing, and in fact it's the oldest and tallest of them all. But Egypt at one point housed two of these structures, and the Pharos, or the Lighthouse of Alexandria, was around surprisingly recently. Sort of. Alexander the Great conquered or liberated Egypt. I'll leave you to decide which, though the Egyptians of the time seem to have thought the latter, since he released them from Persian rule. Either way, he promptly moved on, leaving his best pal Ptolemy in charge of Egypt, ruling as a regent. Ptolemy asserted Egypt's sovereignty pretty early into his reign, and the pharaohdom was restored, in truth as well as in name. Egypt was now part of the Hellenic world, and was a corner of the Hellenic world, which had fascinated Mediterranean cultures for centuries prior. The city of Alexandria was founded to serve as Egypt's great port, superseding the existing Greek port of Naukratis, which was some way upriver. The landscape of Alexandria created the opportunity to haul a bit of stone around and make use of a natural harbour, and to ensure the safe passage of ships to this harbour, Ptolemy initiated construction of a lighthouse. These days, it's sometimes known as the Pharos, and though it takes its name from the island of Pharos, just off the Egyptian coast, its etymology is unknown. It is tempting to link Pharos to Pharaoh, but I'm not sure that holds up. Pharos has entered Greek as a generic term for lighthouse, the way mausoleum has become a generic word for tomb, despite coming from the name of a specific person. Whether the island or the building was called Pharos first is a matter for linguists and historians to debate. Ptolemy died only two years into the 12-year construction project, and it was completed under his son, Ptolemy Philadelphus. It was made almost entirely of limestone and granite, a dramatic tower stretching up over 100 metres lit by a huge furnace. The construction of the lighthouse itself is believed to have cost around 23 tonnes of silver in materials and wages, and was only one part of the work that transformed the natural landscape into a working harbour. It was nominally designed by a friend of Ptolemy's called Sostratus, but just like Imhotep, it's unclear whether he was the architect in name only. One fabulous story goes that while the lighthouse was dedicated to Ptolemy in a plaster frieze, the name of Sostratus was carved into the limestone underneath so that when the plaster inevitably fell away, the true architect would be revealed. That's almost certainly apocryphal, but you've got to love some long-term passive-aggressive tea spilling. If you're conversant in plate tectonics, then you know that part of the world is a precarious place to build tall stone structures. This would prove to be the literal downfall of the lighthouse, as it fell victim to several earthquakes and needed to be rebuilt to different extents several times long into the Middle Ages. A 10th century account by Al Masudi holds that in the early 8th century, a Byzantine eunuch and spy convinced the Caliph that there was treasure in the foundations of the lighthouse. Eager to get his hands on it, the Caliph commissioned the eunuch to lead the exhumation of the treasure. While rooting around the lighthouse's foundations, the eunuch sabotaged them, leading to a considerable collapse. Byzantine Varus needn't have bothered, as nature herself seemed determined to send Ptolemy's beacon into the sea. It was a tapered tower, so while it was bottom heavy and not likely to outright collapse, barring some sort of devastating, I don't know, magnitude 7 earthquake, only the thinner top parts were vulnerable. In 956 CE, the top 20 metres, or 60-ish feet, collapsed following an earthquake that rocked the Mediterranean. 350 years later, final doom was spelled when, what do you know, a magnitude 7 earthquake originating in Crete struck Alexandria, all but completely toppling the lighthouse. The last of its above-water remnants were finally removed in 1480, and its stones were used as part of the construction of a fortress on the nearby Pharos island. The lighthouse's legacy is certainly strong. Numerous proposals have been made through the centuries to rebuild it or to build something in its place. Though the lighthouse is gone, what the sea took is still down there. In 2015, plans, or perhaps more like intentions, were announced to build an underwater museum that would allow the public to view the hundreds of artefacts that sit at the bottom of the harbour without risking damage by moving them. This, as far as I know, remains the intention. 
There are a lot of technical barriers in the way of an endeavour like that, including the fact that construction in the area could prove as damaging to the artefacts as removing them. But if you saw my video about the moving of the Khufu ship to its new home, then you know that Egypt takes its antiquities very seriously and is pretty good at coming up with technical solutions to problems of conservation. Watch this space. No, not this one. This one. Thanks for stopping by, and don't forget, I love to hear from you in the comments. What do you think should happen to the artefacts beneath the Alexandrian harbour? Would you visit an underwater museum? Next week's video will be a bit different, a longer video at last. Speaking of beacons that grant a hope of survival to us as we gaze out at a bleak, dark sea, I'd like to thank my backers at patreon.com slash armchairegypt for their continuing support. Until next time, my fellow armchair Egyptologists, Life, prosperity, and health to you all. Thanks for watching. Head over to my channel for more, or click here to see what the YouTube demons think you should watch next. I hope you'll consider subscribing. If you'd like to support and collaborate on the channel with me, go to patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. You can also join my Discord community. There's an invite link in the description.